Jeffrey, I think the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our winter Boston Business Council meeting. It's great to see all of you here. Uh, just a little bit of background uh, before I introduce tonight's speaker. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jeff Holzer, and together with Craig Rutfield, uh, we are the co-chairs of the ATS Boston Business Council. I really enjoy getting the opportunity to meet the speakers uh, and to work with uh, Craig, Adassa, and Sally to make these meetings uh, beneficial for everybody involved. The Boston Business Council meetings have been a staple of the ATS presence in New England for many years. These meetings bring educational programming from the Technion to the greater Boston and New England communities free of charge and provide a wonderful opportunity for learning, networking, and connecting virtually and in person. We generally meet in person twice a year and on Zoom the other two times. Uh, we're lucky to be able to present the excellence of the Technion locally. And now for the introduction. We're fortunate to have Professor Yoav Shekman joining us from Texas tonight. Associate Professor Shekman heads the Nanobio Optics Laboratory in the Te Technion Faculty of Biomedical Engineering and is a member of the Helen Diller Quantum Center. He is currently on sabbatical at the University of Texas at Austin, where he's a Harrington fa Faculty Fellow. Perfect. Professor Sheckman and his group focus on the development of novel microscopy tools and their applications to biological questions on the nano scale. This includes efforts that span topics such as optical fabrication and design, deep learning, and molecular biology. Professor Sheckman grew up in Haifa and served in the Artillery Corps of the IDF from 1998 to 2001. A Technion alumnus, he earned his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and physics in 2007 and his doctorate in the topic of signal processing and optics in 2013. From 2013 to 16, he conducted postdoctoral studies in chemistry at Stanford University, focusing on super resolution microscopy. Professor Sheckman has received numerous awards, including the Quill Prize for Excellence in Scientific Research and the Daniel Sheeran Memorial Research Prize. He's also a faculty scholar in the Zuckerman STEM Leadership Program, which supports future generations of leaders in science, technology, engineering, and math in the United States and in Israel. Yoav, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction, Jeffrey, and uh, thank you all for joining. Um, it's my, really my pleasure to, to present um, uh, my work and also a bit about myself um, in the context of the Technion and, and a bit beyond. So, the the title of my presentation i have a few titles uh, i couldn't choose so i kept all of them it's a novel computational microscopy or how and why to ruin a perfectly good microscope this is usually my technical titles for technical talks uh, or in this case who i am what i do and why i do it which is what i was asked actually to talk to you about so let's go so a bit about myself um so I was born in, and raised in Haifa, Israel. This is this little blonde guy here in the center. That's me with my sisters. Both my parents are professors. Um, my mom is in the education business and my father is a professor of material engineering. He's pretty famous as far as scientists go. Around the time I looked like this, he discovered quasi-crystals and went on to win a Nobel Prize 30 years later. I served in the artillery for three years. And in my spare time, I played the guitar. This is me. <clears throat> this guy is Shem Tov Lev. He's a famous Israeli musician. Um, so this is what I would really do if I, if I weren't doing this. Now about my academic path. So in 2002, um, I started uh, my studies at the Technion. And this is in yellow I, because this is really my first major choice that I, I've made in life, I think. And arguably the most important one, or one of the most important ones. So why did I go to the Technion? Well, it was clear I wanted to do something rela relating to truth and measurement and, and something, you know, you can really measure and see. Um, and the Technion was a great place. Now, what do you study in the Technion? I had no idea. Everything seemed interesting. 
So I thought, okay, electrical engineering, I could get a job later. It's a good idea. Physics is interesting. This was also the second most difficult program to, to get accepted to. So I thought if it's difficult to get accepted to, I should go there. The first most difficult was medicine. And I knew I wasn't going to be a doctor. So this was it. And from there on, I continued to a PhD in optics and signal processing. Here, I don't even mention this as a choice. It was so so interesting. It was clear that this is what I want to do. Um, I was fortunate to have really amazing mentors at the Technion. This is Professor Moti Segev and Professor Yonina Eldao. Uh, really taught me a lot. And at this point, there is no biology yet in my in my history. There's going there's going to be some biology soon, and because there is no biology in this program and i took one elective course in biology it was kind of interesting okay um uh, but at this point i really had to decide after a phd what what i want to do um i really enjoyed my phd and i thought i want to stay in academia a bit longer and then decide so let's go do a postdoc so postdoc in the us Yes, that seems like a good idea. Where do we go? Um, and I could have, my, 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 my first instinct was to continue along the lines of what I've done so far. But then I thought, you know, maybe this is an, uh, an opportunity. And I was talking to people and they said it might be the last opportunity to really change, somewhat change a field and learn something new. And I thought, what do I want to learn? I want to learn something somehow related to biology, medicine, something like this. Because there's also part, you know, in, in some way I wanted to make a more direct impact with my work, more immediate impact. And I thought biology was somehow a way to do it. Um, how, can I, how can I take what I've learned in optics and engineering and apply to something in biology? And that's how I found W.E. Murner at Stanford University who was working, uh, is really an, a multidisciplinary scientist working in single molecule measurements, um, but also focusing on microscopy and on biological microscopy. So I thought this is really interesting because it's it combines optics, which I know and love, uh, with biology that I don't know, but I want to. So let's go there. Um, and this, and really um, another amazing mentor that I had who turned out to win a Nobel Prize shortly after I arrived. I had nothing to do with this, but but this happened, and um, and so I spent a few years. And I, I'm going to tell you soon what the work that stemmed from from this postdoc, but just as a, an overview of my career. So at this point, we're 2016. Uh, and it's time to go back home. I got a, a job at the Technion. So we packed the kids, the boys, uh, these big ones and the two new American citizens here in 2016, put them in a box, go back to Israel. So back to the Technion, where um, and to this day, except for this sabbatical now, uh, I'm, uh, at, I'm a professor. This is a my group a couple of years ago in a trip in Israel. So that's the major overview. Now let's go into the details of what do we do? So uh, in general, my group develops novel computational imaging methods to observe life on the nanoscale. And more recently, we're trying to improve diagnostics. What does this mean? Computational imaging, what does that what does that even mean? So if you look at a microscope, on the left is a microscope from 100 years ago, and on the right is a microscope from today, more or less. What is the difference? What happened in the last 100 years? Actually, what happened in the last hundreds of years? Well, not much. Not much in terms of the optics. It's lenses and some mechanics to hold them. But the big difference is here. There is a computer, there is a camera, and there's a computer between the image and the human. 
if a hundred years ago you had to look here in the eyepiece and see whatever you're looking at and then draw it in a notebook to share with your fellow scientists now you just take an image you have it on your computer and this is where the magic can happen because you don't have to take just a standard image you can take a distorted image and if you have the processing power in the computer to analyze this you can extract all kinds of information that a standard microscope does not give you and i will show you examples okay so when you put the computer between the image and the human you have a whole new playground you can do really exciting things and this is called computational microscopy and that's much of what we do so let me give you a specific example and this example is called localization microscopy. What you see here is part of a cell. So uh, this is uh, a tiny, tiny cell. And what you see here this are, is, is um, millions of fluorescent glowing molecules that are attached to this structure in the cell. It's called the microtubules. It's like the skeleton of the cell. But this thing has... Uh, smaller features than we see here. We cannot see these small features because all microscopes have limited resolution, just like all cameras and all imaging systems. In this case, the resolution is about a quarter of a micron. Anything smaller than that is going to be blurry. You can't see it. But you do want to see it because biology on this scale has interesting structure and you want to learn about it. How do you do it? So you have to play some trick. You can't buy a more expensive microscope because it's not, it's not about technology. It's a physical fundamental problem, limitation. So the trick here is that instead of capturing this single image, you capture a movie. The movie looks like this, blinking movie. And what you see blinking here, I'm just running through the frames of the movie, are each one of these spots is a single fluorescent molecule. It's a tiny, tiny molecule, a nanometer scale, but you see it as maybe a 200 nanometer blob because of the limited resolution of the microscope. And what you do now is you feed all this to the computer. The computer takes each one of these spots and puts a dot in the center of each spot. And that's a relatively easy problem to solve computationally. You just ask, where's the center of this blob? And then you end up with many, many spots on the right here. And slowly but surely, you're building up this super resol resolved image. You get a very high resolution image, 10 times better than what you could get naively by just observing with the microscope. So it's a computational method. And you spread the information in time. So the whole thing must be static. It cannot move. How do you get these molecules to blink? There are various ways to do this chemically and optically. And that's it, you win. You have your tenfold increase in resolution and you can see structures you could, couldn't see before. There's no way to see them. We did not invent this. This was actually part of the Nobel Prize, W. E. Murner and Eric Betzig and Stefan Hell in 2014. Where do we come in? So this is the ideal story I told you. You have your tiny, tiny molecule, looks big because you're imaging the, with a limited resolution microscope. But that's fine. All you have to do is find the center. You can write an algorithm that does that. And one by one, you build up this image. The problem is that in reality, you can measure something like this, where you have multiple of these molecules. They overlap. You can't just run a simple algorithm and tell you where each one is. And many attempts have been made in doing this. To some extent, you can do it, but it's all very computationally uh, resource demanding. Now, at the time where I approached this problem, it was 2016, and, and it was clear that it might be worth it to do, uh, to use a, what was kind of new tool, which was deep learning. So a few words about deep learning, what this, what this means. So, so when you talk about deep learning or neural nets, um, some people call it, call it AI, artificial intelligence. The idea is that you, have an algorithm that you train 
by giving it many, many examples. So for example, you can take an algorithm, feed it thousands of images of cats and thousands of images of dogs and tell the algorithm which is a cat and which is a dog. And then the next time it sees an image of a cat or a dog that it's never seen before, it's going to be able to, to, um, to determine whether it's a cat or a dog just by looking at many, many examples and crunching the numbers. That's it. Because an image is just a collection of numbers at, at the end of the day. So for the algorithm, it doesn't matter. It's an image. It's just a bunch of numbers. It's a matrix of numbers. And the output is, is so it can classify between different classes. And you could do cats and dogs. You can do boats and trees or, or a thousand different classes. You can do, uh, of course, um, optical character recognition and so on. And these algorithms turn out to be extremely powerful in, in image processing. And we've known that they can be used for all kinds of medical applications, uh, even for single image to, to, to improve the resolution of single images. And we asked, can we use this approach for our problem, for dense molecule fitting? Seems simple and actually does work very well. So that's our first work in this field of combining super resolution with deep learning. Um, you just take your a neural net, you feed it thousands of examples that you simulate in the computer. And so you know what you should be looking at. You know the ground truth positions of these molecules. You blur the image such that it would appear as if it was measured in your microscope. And that's it. And then you, once you've, you show this, the algorithm 10,000 of these images, the next time or so, the next time it sees an image it's never seen before, it can fit it immediately. This works extremely well. So, so that was our first journey into, into deep learning with super resolution microscopy. But things become really interesting when you consider that objects that you observe in a microscope or in any imaging system are not flat. They have some thickness. Usually this doesn't matter if you're talking about a camera and you're taking an image of a person you don't care about or whatever, you know, at these scales, maybe it doesn't matter. Although I'm going to show you at the end some, some examples where that does matter. But in, in microscopy, for example, if you consider um, one of these molecules that was blinking, for example, or any point that you're trying to look at, what you see here is a model of a microscope. And when the point, in, when the point is in focus, then in the camera, you see a nice little point. But when it goes out of the focal plane, you see a blur, as you can see here. And this means that if you're going to image or track something in 3D in a microscope, very quickly you're going to have a problem. It's going to disappear, move out of focus, becomes blurry. As we all know from our experience with the cameras and other imaging systems. And if you want to image something volumetric with, you know, in 3D, you have to do something, you have to modify the optical system somehow to allow for that. So for example, in nature, the way we do it is that we don't have one eye, right? We have two eyes. And if you look at something from two different viewpoints, you can figure out the 3D structure of this or the distance from this object. But in microscopy, it's really difficult technically to add a second viewpoints because these objectives are fat and they have a very short working distance. You can fit two of them to observe or at least it's very difficult. How can you do this from one viewpoint? How can you infer 3D information from a single viewpoint? And so this is a lot of our work. And this was my, most of my work at Stanford dealt with that question. We ended up doing the following thing. We take the microscope and we modify it physically. We add an optical element here. This is called a phase mask. And I'm gonna talk about this a bit later as well. But it's really a physical optical element, a transparent element. What you see here in color, it's not really colorful, it's transparent, but the color here encodes the depth of the element or how thick it is in different positions in the element. So it's like a lens, but really a distorted lens. The end result of sticking this into the back focal plane, a special place in the, in the microscope, is that your point source no longer looks like a point. You see, it looks like this shape that changes dramatically as it moves in and out of focus. Now, if you now take your eye and observe a microscope that has this element in it, and you look at something, it would look terrible. You ruined your microscope. 
you don't understand what you're seeing because it's all going to be distorted in this way. Every point in your object, object is just a collection of points, is going to look like some shape. But you're not going to look at it with your eyes. We have a computer. The computer is going to analyze these images and the computer is going to tell you the 3D structure that you're, you're after from, this, from processing these kinds of images. And I'll show you examples of this. By the way, this specific shape of a face mask um, turns out to be the optimal way that you can encode the 3D position of a point in a microscope. You could stick any kind of distorted lens here, but if you put this one, then for a given amount of photons that your emitter emits, you're going to have the highest precision in determining where it is. You achieve this by solving some optimization problem. So this is what um, a face mask can look like. It's just a piece of glass or quartz that you etch at different thicknesses with technology that's similar to semiconduct to how they do in the semiconductor industry with photolithography. Or you can take um, something that looks like a monitor, a very tiny monitor that controls the the optical phase in each pixel. And then you can program it. And each of these have their own advantages and disadvantages. Anyway, once you've done this, you can start looking at, at things. And let, so let me show you what things look like. So this is a normal biological mam mammalian cell, but you see it has red spots inside. And the red spots are the telomeres. These are the edges of the chromosomes and they are labeled with fluorescent molecules. So you see it in red overlaid on this image. If you just observe this cell in a microscope, you see these telomeres, they appear like dots. They're tiny, so that's why they appear like dots. And they move around, and they move around because the cell is alive and DNA is, is, is wiggling and it's all a big mess and it's moving around. And some many people care about this motion. But the point here is that you see some of these are in focus and some are really out of focus. They become like these big circles, but they're not really big circles. They just appear out of focus. Some of them are practically invisible. So if you want to capture the dynamics of this whole thing, you can put in our phase mask, this tetrapod phase mask. And then now you see each one of these spots, it's the same cell. Each one of them became this strange shape and, and each one is a different shape because it's it's a, it's in a different depth and the shape changes as the point moves to different depths so here on the bottom movie you you get all the dynamics you want it's all in there the information is, and the information on the position of each one of the telomeres in this case is in this movie now you have this uh, analysis problem where you have to figure out what's going on you have to build an algorithm that's going to convert from this to 3D positions in time. And that's really difficult. If if the 2D problem was difficult, then the 3D problem here is more difficult because now the shapes are, of each one of these is not even, are not even the same. It's different shapes that they overlap. Again, so how, you know, how do you make sense of this? So again, we trained Elias, my PhD student, um, trained a neural net again. Now it receives this kind of these kind of images, simulated images of just random positions of points, how they would appear in our system, and it outputs the three D volume of where they are, where each point is, and that works pretty well. So this is one of the um, this is a cell with its telomeres labeled, and here are the the reconstructions. These little oval shapes are the actual positions where the the, the telomeres are, uh, and in green is where we think they are, and we got it pretty well. And next I'll show you how we improved it further. But before that, remember our blinking movie of molecules that gave us a super resolved uh, image of, these, of the cytoskeleton of the cell? That was a flat sample, but now we have a volumetric, a thick sample, and these are molecules blinking. Each shape here is a molecule in a different depth. So if we are gonna add up, if we're gonna run this through our network and gather all the little localizations in 3D, we're gonna build up an image 
in 3D. And that's exactly what we get. So if you take this movie and build an image out of it, then you get this three-dimensional structure. So this is mitochondria in, in cells. So at super resolution, sub sub wavelength resolution. So again, you have a, you only have a 2D image, but you encoded 3D information in it. And you take a movie, computationally reconstruct 3D, 3D shapes. Now the question is, maybe I told you previously that you could use any phase mask or any distorted optical element in, in the path of your microscope and encode, and you get some kind of shape. Are we using the best possible shape for our task? Or maybe we should be using a different phase mask. And if so, which one? I mean, how do we design the optimal one? And this turns out to be an easy question to answer, to ask, but very difficult to answer. Um, and I don't know of, a, of an optimization problem that would solve it. So we ended up doing, to answer it, we did. To answer this, we did a very interesting thing, I think, which was to let the neural net that deciphers all of this information also tell us how it would like the information to be encoded. So while we are teaching this neural net to infer 3D positions, we are allowing it to change. It's all done in simulation. So we are allowing it to change the way the, fa the phase mask in this imaging system, in the model. And this is what happens if you let the neural net tell you what phase mask it would like to have, such that the reconstruction is best. Then slowly over the iterations, it, le it learns this shape of a phase mask. And here on the right, you can see what happens to a point source in different depth positions given this phase mask, how it would appear. And that's it. And now we got our answer from the neural net, what it would like us to do as, our, as the optics people, such that the network does the best job it can. And so if you compare what you measure with the old tetrapod mask and with this new homus mask, and the reason I call it a homus mask is because this thing really, really looks like a homus uh, plate. So it's an informal name. Anyway, if you now count how many telomeres you can find, you can find much more here. So this was a good idea. So the, we let the neural net tell us what we should do experimentally. We follow it and it works. Okay. Um, as a, as a final kind of uh, technical thing we can do um, with our phase mass, I want to mention another degree of freedom, which is color. All of the cameras we use in microscopy are grayscale cameras. They, they're black and white cameras. It's not that the technology of color cameras didn't make it to, to microscopy, but whenever you use a color camera in your cell phone or whatever, you all you actually the detector is black is grayscale it count it's just black and white but you put filters on it tiny filters on the on each pixel there's a filter and this throws a, in a green filter a red filter blue filter and this throws away a lot of the light and in microscopy we we a lot we often don't want to lose light because photons are precious and so we use black and white cameras when you use black and white cameras how do you see color well, you don't see color, so you have to somehow, but if you want to see something in different colors, then you have to, to do something like change your filters in time and take multiple images or split your cameras into a, a camera that you say, ah, this has a green filter. So this is a green camera, this is a red camera, but then it becomes pretty cumbersome. And what we realized a few years ago is that these the same way we encode depth in, the, in, the, in this shape that's called the point spread function, that you've seen that was changing as a function of depth, we can also encode color. How does this work? So if you have two point sources, these are just flu tiny fluorescent beads. One is green and one is red, but we don't know which is which because we're using a black and white camera. But if you place this mask, this specific mask, and of course it's more general than this, as you'll see, but if you place this mask in the path, and you look through the microscope, this is what you see. And here's the, this is incredible because there's no computation. The optics does this, okay? You look with your eye and you see the word red in the microscope, even before any computer. So what we're doing here is we're distorting light in a very, very specific way. 
such red red um, point becomes the word red, and a green point becomes the word green at the same time using a single optical element. So this is really a strong degree of freedom. Now, this is a cool demonstration, maybe. It's not useful for anything other than that, but it shows that it works. And so, but now we can really track objects in 3D in multiple colors on the same optical channel. And I can tell you from this movie, for example, that this diffusing little particle is green, whereas all the others are red. And I know this because it's diagonal. And I also know it's 3D position because of the exact shape that it, that it creates. So that's the kind of degrees of freedom we have. And that's the kind of, of that's the basis of what we do. And then we, we have all kinds of variations on these themes, like splitting different channels, um, designing shapes that change the way a point looks depending on where it is on the field of view, not just depth and many technical advances like that. And one more thing we can do, actually, now we can even go back to the 2D flat case. If you remember the blinking movie I showed you, I showed you two blinking movies. One of them was just spots in the first one. Think about what happens if your object is moving while it's blinking, okay? Because remember, the way we build an image is we just accumulate all these blinks, we add them up together, we get an image. So if the object was moving while it was blinking, that would be a major problem because now you add up different points, but they're in different times and they were in different positions. So you're going to end up with some blur, one big blur. And so the real holy grail in this super resolution business is to do dynamics. How do you get super resolution without paying the cost that your object has to be static? And by static, it could, it could mean a few minutes. So your cell cannot move at all for a few minutes. Now cells move. They don't listen to you if you tell them not to move. So you have to fix them. And when you fix them, they change their properties. So you really want to be imaging things that are as close as possible to, to live biology. How do you do it? How do you do it as super resolution? So that's our um, relatively recent work. I'm not going to go into the details because it's a bit more complicated, but it's, again, it's a neural network, but it's kind of recursive neural network. So each frame goes in and then the next frame goes in and so on. And it depends on the output of the old frames. But at the end of the day, let me run this again, it was too quick. You get this kind of movie on the left and on the right, this is a reconstruction you get. So it's super resolution at dynamics. So this is a live cell. So these microtubules are moving. It's hard to see, but here, actually here, it will be easier to see. This is mitochondria again, moving. It's from this kind of blinking movie, you get this kind of super resolved movie. So video to video at super resolution. This was the, the work of Alon Sagi, my PhD student, collab collaborators from Germany. Um, so yeah, and there's, there's, there's lots of, validation and verification going to such work because because we're really doing something that there is no uh, no existing way to do and whenever you develop a method that there's no benchmark for it's it's diff it's very difficult to prove that it's doing what you think it is so we had to to think of different ways to do this if you were interested I can uh, please ask me and I'll tell you what we did okay so as we are um, maturing as a group, uh, we are looking more and more into real world applications. So this is fun. You know, we're developing these imaging systems, doing crazy things with photons, but what is this really good for? So let me show you some uh, beyond basic biology that I won't actually mention a lot, which we do. Let me show you some real world applications. So. Uh, here's one topic that we became interested in recently. And this is called optical mapping of DNA. So the story is this. You have DNA. How do you have DNA? Like uh, um, you take from a human sample or from some environmental sample, bacterial sample, you get DNA. You stretch the DNA. DNAs are just long molecules. You stretch them on glass, 
In this case, it's inside nano channels. And then what you do, if you just observe this now, DNA on a nano channel, you see nothing because it's tiny and there's not much to see. If you take fluorescent molecules that are attached to specific N, uh, molecules, other molecules that bind, they attach to specific points in the DNA. Wherever you have, you know, DNA has four letters, different nucleic acids, uh, they're called G, C, T, and A. So we're in, in our DNA in our body is, is about a two billion long such sequence in, all, in each one of our cells. If you look, um, if you take the right molecules that attach fluorescent, to fluorescent molecules, they bind to every place where you have a specific subsequence in your DNA, like wherever you have CTTAG or wherever you have whatever, some other sequence. And then what happens at every point in the DNA that has this sequence, you get a spot, a, a light, a spot of light, a single fluorescent molecule. Now we take this image, you capture it, and you have a barcode. And this barcode can tell you something about this DNA. For example, it can tell you whether this comes from a specific bacteria or whether this, whether there has been some chromosomal translocation some changes in the DNA of the human, things like this. And this is what we're interested in. And of course, this is a problem. This technology exists. We did not invent this, but it's a problem that's similar to this blinking of overlap, of overlapping emitters problem, because you, you sometimes these two sequences can be very close to one another. And in this case, you have two very adjacent spots. So that's okay. We know how to handle that. Okay. So we're building algorithms to deal with these things. Um, ultimately, we, we the, the reason we got into this is because we wanted to do pathogen identification. You know, to take a patient sample and tell you and tell you very quickly what bacteria is causing this person's infection, for example. And that's a, some promising way to do this. And we're still there's still an effort in the lab to to get this to work. Um, these examples are are from human DNA, which are easier for us to work with. So that's one application. Another application in the diagnostics world is, uh, this is Amit's project, um, is to measure um, the concentration of proteins in, in human samples. So for example, you want to measure how much, in this case, it's IL-6, it's cytokine of the, it's a protein of the immune system. You want to know how much of this a patient has for various reasons. Uh, and we devised um, a, a relatively simple way to measure this quantity. Uh, using beads, these are fluorescent beads that adhere with and with uh, antibodies to the specific protein we're looking for, which is also labeled fluorescently. We flow the whole thing in a flow channel. We image it as it flows. We do some image processing, some fancy optics, some statistics, and we give and we for, with a few minutes of measurements and pretty small amounts of liquid or blood or sample, we can tell you the concentration of this. Uh, this was just awarded a, a grant by the European Research Council for trying to, we're trying to uh, seek uh, paths for commercialization of this approach. Another uh, project now, <clears throat> it was also awarded this grant recent, uh, last year. The idea is here to fabricate uh, optical elements quickly and simply and cheaply. And the motivation for this really came for us because from these phase masks that I kept talking to you about previously, um, these distorted little lenses that we have to somehow fabricate, this turns out to be very difficult to do, fabricating these tiny elements. And the reason is that the resolution in which you need to fabricate it um, is smaller than wavelength, so it means 100 nanometers or so in, in, in or less in resolution of fabrication, and that's why we have to do this in clean in in a clean room with uh, much like in the semiconductor uh, fabrication environment, extremely resource consuming, extremely long, and so on, and expensive. And we realized that you could do a, some small trick that would enable much, much easier fabrication. That trick is to match together two different materials with different refractive indices 
that are pretty close. And that allows you to scale everything up. Once you scale everything up, you have an element on the right that's much thicker, much thicker than the, what you had before. And you can actually just 3D print it with existing 3D printers, which simplifies things by orders of magnitude. So we're fabricating these elements now. It looks like this. Um, <clears throat> for all kinds of purposes, These are this is one of our phase masks, but we also do kind of vortex beams for various reasons. But we also did lens arrays and uh, gratings and so on. So it's really a general solution. And we're seeking uh, interesting applications for this as well. Um, finally, you know, we talked about microscopy a lot, but if you think about optics, um, the, the nice thing about optics is it's, the, it's, it's pretty uniform across scales. It's the same equations. So what this means is that whatever works in a microscope should also work in larger scales. What about a telescope, for example? Nadav likes to uh, build crazy optical systems. And he, so he said, you know, let's see if this thing works in a telescope. He took a telescope. He modified it. He added this phase mask inside. And what you see here is my car. I'm driving it here. And Dav is taking this image with a telescope. And you see this image is distorted. So just like we distort images of single molecules so that we can tell the distance or the depth of the molecule, we distort the image of the car Oops, and let me, yeah. And as it's going with some relatively simple computational analysis, you can determine the distance from the car from a single viewpoint. Okay, so this is a telescope that gives you an image. The image is a bit distorted, but it, but it tells you how far away the object is. And there's no active, there's no laser, there's no LIDAR, there's no stereo, no two cameras, a single camera just by this additional optical element. So just to show you a bit about, I, it, Nadav did this seminar a few days ago, so I have a few cool images to show you. So this is the kind of stuff we were building. Uh, Nadav was building, this is a stick with two lights on it because we had to calibrate our telescope. So I was walking around for a kilometer holding a stick and then he was measuring my distance. This is what such an experiment looks like. So just to show you, we're pretty versatile. We also step out of the lab. We're doing uh, interdisciplinary stuff. This was the first version of this stick. It's just two cell phones with the lights on. Okay, so that's just a bit of fun that we're having. So this is pretty much all about my uh, work. Um, and I'll be happy to take questions. Before that, I just want to share with you some of the things that are going on in the Technion at this, uh, given the situation now in the war. So uh, 2,500 students approximately were recruited. This is a huge number and Technion has to, and, and does uh, accommodate for that in various ways. Um, first of all, this semester was postponed by a few extra weeks relative to other universities and, and the whole school, all the schools in Israel were postponed. So there's that, there's financial benefits that uh, are given to reservists, like money, dorm, a rent waiver, and so on. And really, there's the whole technique is recruited for, for this and, um, and is doing a pretty impressive job, in my opinion. And of course, we all ask ourselves, okay, well, what can we all do? I have a very simple answer to that, but it's my personal opinion. My personal opinion is this. We keep doing what we do best. We do more and better. Because Israel is, is in a hard time now. It's going to be some harder times. And I think the Technion plays a key role in making sure that the we're going to have the strong economy that we need. We need these engineers for the short term, for the long term, the entrepreneurs, all of this. Keep doing this, keep doing the research. If there's no funds, if there's less funds in Israel, we go for the European grants and so on. So we all have to work a bit harder, um, but that's the only way out. Okay, with that, 
I'd like to thank you. This is the, the group. Thank you for listening. And I'm happy to take questions. I'll start with a question. Um, this is Steve. Do you um, have an opinion as to the most likely areas of research that this technology would be applied to? Do you see it mostly to immunology or cancer research or some other field uh, that would be more likely for this to be effective in helping resolve their problems? Well, yeah, so most of our work uh, beyond the, developing the method itself, which is mostly what we do. So we mostly what we do is develop methods and we seek biologists who are or or uh, or doc or clinicians um, that are that have problems that this can help. Okay, but most of the work is is method development. So where can this help? So in um, basic biological research, for example, you're interested in in learning how cells function on a very basic level. What happens to the structure of DNA uh, as the cell undergoes some process? You know? So for a question like that, you need pretty fancy microscopy because everything is so small and the measurements are very indirect. You can't really see what you're interested. You're only seeing some indirect proxy of what you're interested in. Um, so basic biology, I think, is the major uh, is the major client. And also, as I as I've mentioned, I've shown you two applications of diagnostics where I think we could we could make a difference. So that's in DNA mapping and uh, in uh, sensitive biomarker detection. Uh, maybe I, if I can ask a question, uh, this is Baruch Tito. Thank you for that wonderful work you have. Um, as a as a biochemist myself, uh, it's just amazing that the degree of of imaging that you can get, how how, how super resolution can work now to get the, the the levels here are are unprecedented. I think in terms of the images and the spatial resolution, but from from the way I think about it, that we're now at the point where you're you're using labels to identify the cells, and at, at lower resolution, we never really thought about what the label mm. size itself is, or, or or whether that's affecting it. But now you're at a resolution size where you're actually not quite labeling the cell; you're labeling a label's distance away. And mm. so, how how does that affect the way? you are thinking about the spatial resolution and, and whether, how do you account for that, that, that you're actually not, you're, you're getting such good resolution that you're, no, you're now uh, affected by the actual size of the label. And can you, can you get smaller labels or, or nano labels that, that, don't, that don't have that effect? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. We, actually, we are one order of magnitude away from this problem. If because we are still in the 50 nanometer regime or so, but it, your question is extremely valid because nowadays you can people are developing methods to measure things on the nanometer resolution. So then it really is a problem because because then yeah you're imaging the label the label has a linker the linker is you know 20 nanometers away what are you even what are you even imaging in our case we're still not really at this problem. Sometimes we see this, for example, um, maybe, yeah. So for example, if you think of a, of a microtubule and then you have linkers all around it and you measure the 3D structure, then you get the diameter that you measure is not the diameter of the microtubule, it's the diameter of the microtubule plus your linker. And so yeah. you have to know, you have to somehow know what the length of the linker is and the, yeah, and then you account for it. For example, that, that's, that's something that you do have to account for. In most of our application, we're not at this exquisite single nanometer level resolution that we really uh, worry about this. But we do have to, like, if you would use a probe that's 200 nanometers, 
yeah, that, that's way too big. We can't do that. So we use single molecules and, and we are an order of magnitude away from this problem still. Okay. Yeah, if I can ask another question, then you talked about biomarkers and quantification. So, mm. but but you're you're now functioning a level where the reference standards aren't, aren't really established. So when, when you want to make an absolute count of something, mm. yeah, I, I know you can do relative, but if you want to make an absolute count of a biomarker or, or some other aspect of the cell, even mitochondria, how, how, how will you establish what the reference standards are in order to be able to make absolute counts? Or is that important to you? Well, it, for example, if, if you, yeah, the, when there is no reference, then there is no reference. So if, if we are trying to measure something that there is an existing measurement for, but this measurement is expensive and, and time consuming, then we can compare to that. Mm -hmm. If we do have an absolute measurement of some protein that, you know, at the end, in a, in a lab result, you get a number, right? This and this picograms per milliliter. So if there is a way to measure it, we can always benchmark to that. If not, then sometimes there is, um, the important parameter is the change, you know, if, if you monitor some um, some protein and 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 you, you see an increase, maybe that's as in itself is interesting, and that's that's the relative part that you mentioned. Yes. So when we have a reference, we can compare to something. We don't. We we don't. Very good. Uh, if I can ask one more. So when when you get to the lower resolutions where you need these nanobodies or smaller, much smaller probes. Yeah, yeah. Does, does the Technion have the capability of making that or is that something that Technion is working towards at this point? Well, we we buy our fluorophores from commercial companies. We don't develop the fluorophores themselves. Okay. At least that's my group. Um, there are groups in the Technion that develop um, nanobodies, fluorescent nanobodies, uh, quantum dots, all kinds, yeah. Okay. All right, so that. Okay, sure. uh, you know, you mentioned several times that you're sort of in the middle of this, you know, maybe I, it's hard to say if you're in the beginning, middle, or end of the process, but you're working through the process to try to reach certain goals that you that you set for yourself. I also saw in the, in the, in the slides you showed uh, other labs in other countries uh, also doing similar kinds of things. How does that collaboration work? Do you share ideas? Do they push you when you push them? Uh, how does this, that, that scientific process work with people in you know disparate parts of the world? So there's different ways to uh, initiate collaborations. Uh, each one is a pretty unique story, but in general, a successful, from my experience, a successful collaboration is when you, uh, well, it's well, it's synergetic, right? So, so you collaborate with groups who uh, who do things that you don't do, and you can learn from them. They can learn from you, and you don't, you know, you have co uh, a com completing capabilities. For example, uh, for example, with the with the group in Germany that I've shown, uh, they had live cell data of of blinking molecules in live cells. Blinking molecules in live cells is not trivial for us, but they do it all the time. So they had the data, we have the way to analyze this data. And we learned and we we met and we talked and we said, hey, let's do this together. So that's one example. Um, various groups around the world have asked us to send them these diffractive optical elements that we 3D print and um, because they need an optical element, it's too, expensive or whatever complicated for them to do it we just we send them so it's always some complementary uh thing we, we 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 never we don't really collaborate with groups who are really doing what we what we do because that that kind of collaboration does does make sense usually i think dan barish has a question hi uh Joe, you know, thanks for taking us through your work. It's really amazing uh, stuff that you guys are able to figure out. I just wanted to ask, I have a colleague, a friend, the local university who 
uh, it seems to be doing something similar with nuclear magnetic resonance imaging, where they're shooting, um, I'm not exactly sure what they're shooting at, like uh, atoms, and then they're taking at, at many, they're getting billions of points of measurement, and then using that to come up with what they what what they think it looks like at like the uh, nuclear subatomic level or something. It, to my layman's perspective, it sounds very similar to what you're doing, perhaps on a different scale, but I thought there might be some synergies if you guys are not already collaborating with folks that are doing this. It, is, it, does it, does this sound familiar or similar, and would you be interested in understanding what they're doing if I were to connect you? The, the, the second question, the answer is yes, I'm interested um, in learning definitely. Uh, we really have to go. I, I would have to understand the details more because, because, uh, um, I mean, NMR is such a different modality that it's 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 a different physics really, and so the limitations are different, and so maybe the solutions are different. But but having said that, sometimes um, I mean, the most interesting ideas jump from field to to right. field, right? I mean, like for example, this. This uh, this trick with uh, blinking molecules. People took this and did this in ultrasound imaging. What are the molecules in ultrasound images? They're, they're micro bubbles that burst. So it's uh, but but from then on, it's completely analogous in terms of image now. Well, not completely, but relatively analogous. So maybe there's something like that in NMR. I I don't know. Yeah. I don't know enough. I, I think. I think the applications are different, but the process is very similar in what you're both trying to solve. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to get more information from him and uh, see if I can introduce both of your works to each other to see if there's any ideas that it, it helps you each with your own research. Okay, thanks. thanks. That's great, Dan, thank you. Um, I, I have a non-technical question. Uh, you're mm -hmm. currently on sabbatical in Texas, continuing mm -hmm. your work there. Do you? While you're in Texas, are you working with a, a, a different team there, or are you sending your information back to your team in 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 Haifa? Um, how yeah. does that work? So again, each sub, each sabbatical is a different story, from my understanding. Um, in some sabbaticals, you you collaborate, you you immerse yourself in in some existing project, and you become part of that project, specific project for your. That's not what I'm doing. What I'm doing here is um, um, collaborating, looking for interesting collaborations, um, and starting new projects with with local people here. So, for example, we are now looking into uh, uh, we're collaborating here uh, on. On phase uh, phase mask engineering for for different very specific microscopy challenges that people have here. So it's 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 basically starting up new new projects and and looking for new venue new interesting ideas. At the same time, the projects in Israel are still ongoing, and I'm I'm zooming a lot in the mornings with the with the guys in Israel, and keeping that stuff going on. Mm -hmm. We're approaching the uh, the hour at which I become a pumpkin. Um, are, do we have any other questions for our speaker? I don't see any in the in the chat, Steve. So awesome. awesome. So I'll I'll, I'll wrap up uh, by first of all uh, thanking you, Yoa, very much for your time today, uh, for making time for us. Um, uh, we we really appreciate it, um, both from the Technion and from our regional Boston Business Council. Um, it, it's it's great when we have people who are on the cutting edge of, of technology and, and, and they're able to share with us uh, what their technology is and where it's going. So uh, we, we can't thank you enough for making time for us. Um, thank I'd you. Also, oh, thank you. I'd also like to thank uh, Craig and Jeff. Craig, uh, I had a last minute uh, conflict and couldn't be here tonight, but. Craig, uh, Jeff, as usual, uh, filled in um, fa fabulously for uh, for both he and Craig in, in representing the leadership of the Boston Business Council. Uh, great job, Jeff. Thank you so much uh, for stepping in and, and taking over tonight. 
Uh, and I'd like to thank all of our participants. Uh, I, I hope you found it as interesting uh, as I did. And, uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, they were obviously uh, all uh, excellent questions. And, uh, and we'll, uh, Sally, uh, I'm sure we'll look to uh, help facilitate a follow-up uh, with making uh, connections. Um, we're, we're so pleased in Boston to be able to offer uh, events such as this. Uh, we don't have our next event fully scheduled yet, but uh, we anticipate that it will be uh, sometime this spring. Uh, so uh, look for notices uh, from us uh, when we have able to uh, iron out the details of our next speaker and the timing of uh, when we will uh, look to share that speaker with you. Uh, that said, um, thank you all for being here. If there are no other comments or questions, uh, I will wish you all a wonderful evening uh, and a, a, a healthy uh, new year, and uh, we'll see you soon. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.